right, so we're here to talk about uh, test optional and what this means for students who are going to be uh, applying to college in 2023 and beyond. Now, uh, this is a complicated topic and, and lots of people have lots of different thoughts about how do you approach this. So I'm gonna share you kind of my rubric for uh, thinking through this question, um, and then we'll talk through, um, you know, what you need to know about each of these pathways, how to tell what you should do, and then I'm going to share a bunch of resources with you as well that you can use to educate yourself and, and help you make make this decision in in a healthy, sane, timely manner. That's that's my goal. Um, I should probably stop to introduce myself. I always just sort of assume everyone I'm talking to knows who I am, but that's not the case. I'm Sheila. I am Signet Education's president and COO. Now, Signet is a full service academic support company. We do academic tutoring, test preparation, obviously. We also do a lot of college admissions work and executive function coaching for students in eighth grade and older. And what we really like to do is take a look at the whole picture, um, not just the whole picture of your educational journey, but also the whole picture of the student. Um, so you'll hear me talking about things like their stress levels and their other commitments, because we don't want to pretend any of this happens in a vacuum. We all live in a real world and it can be a scary and stressful place. So I, I want to acknowledge that up front. So let's dive in. If I can move my slide. Okay. Um, I like to start with a little bit of why you should listen to me. I'm not just some lady on the internet with a microphone. Um, I do personally have 20 years of test prep and college admissions experience. At Signet, we advise hundreds of clients a year. Every single one of them talks to me multiple times a year. Many of them are my own clients. I do work with students myself. Um, and I've built and managed our team of 60, more than 60 um, former admissions officers, tutors, and coaches for my entire tenure at Signet, which is now going on 13 years. So I know a couple of things about this industry. I don't claim to be the only expert or the best expert, but I'm the one you got, uh, and I think I have some good things to share. Um, but beyond my own personal experience and, and education and you know credentials, um, I think the thing that uh, makes me feel I have something to share that you all should listen to is our core values here at Signet. Uh, as I said, we approach things from a very holistic perspective. And part of that is being guided by our values. So we use these values to hire people, to uh, train our team, to interact with our students, to interact with our clients. Um, and they are actually very, very meaningful and functional for us. They're not just a poster on the wall. Um, I'm not gonna read them out to you or explain to you, but I, I think you can kind of see where we're coming from just from these values alone. So I like to point that out because it's gonna help you understand what, what to expect from me uh, going forward here. But I want to start with the basics. So these are some of the questions we get. Um, and there's no bad question. Um, some of these may feel very elementary to others of you. Um, some of them may be a little bit more sophisticated. You didn't even know you had to think about it. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that this landscape is changing on a daily basis. Uh, not only is college admissions uh, as a process and uh, as a uh, I don't know, competitive uh, force in our education system changing all the time. Testing is also changing. We have some very real differences uh, or changes in tests coming up and the way tests are used and the policies that colleges are using to evaluate candidates using test scores are also changing. Um, so it's important, even if you feel you know this stuff or you've been through this before, it's important to stay in touch uh, with you know, current trends and research. Um, and I hope that I can give you some of that today. So we're going to cover all of these, how test scores are used in the admissions process, what the differences are between the ACT and the SAT, what is test optional, uh, what does that mean, <laughs> what does it mean for you specifically, what do these pathways look like, if you're going to test, what do you need to do, if you're not going to test, what do you need to be thinking about, and then how do you decide, how do you bring a framework to this so that you are not just making guesses in the dark, but you're actually using some data and and, and uh, relying on trusted uh, 
opinions and, and expertise so that you can make the best decision for your child, your family, your goals. So I want to start with how test scores are used in college admissions. Now, in the US, vast majority of colleges will describe their admissions process as holistic. And there's some cynical people that say, well, holistic just means they can do what they want and they're not accountable to anything. Um, but what it really means is they are going to evaluate a student based on a number of factors and based on uh, context of that student, other priorities that a university may have, they may give more or less weight to some area uh, or some piece of the application. And it's not that there's a formula, this is 40% of the decision and this is 3% of the decision, um, but they may be paying a little bit more attention to or reading more into a different aspect of a student's application um, based on those factors. So NACAC, which is the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, of which we are a part, um, they release a survey every year of a whole bunch of member institutions, and they ask them, of these pieces of the application, what do you see as most important? What are you looking at the most to evaluate whether a student is a good fit for your college? And this is roughly the order, starting with grades and going all the way down to financial need, um, though, of course, at different schools, financial need might might be a more important factor than than at others. Um, but uh, for the past several years, the top factors have stayed roughly the same, of course, with the exception of SAT ACT scores, given that nobody could take a test right at the beginning of COVID in the first years of the pandemic. So you can see here that SAT and ACT scores are not the only thing that matters, and they are also not the most important thing generally for students at even the most selective colleges. So I'm going to spend today talking about what do you do about testing, but I really want to highlight that for you that it is not all about testing. Testing may not be the make or break factor for your student. We have had students, we've seen students get perfect scores and not get into the colleges that they were targeting. Um, and other students with less than perfect scores get into some of those very, very selective colleges that, you know, maybe they were below average for, um, for that college. So it's not the end all be all. And I wanna make sure you keep it in perspective because I've seen people focus so much on test scores that they miss out on you know a reasonable focus on grades or on extracurriculars or building teacher relationships or being involved in their community all of those things are quite important now depending on your student and your priorities even the types of schools that you're going to um, try to apply to different things on this list may mean more to you or maybe a place where you can do more than others. Um, this is not to say you have to do all of these at the most extreme level, right? That's just not tenable. So you need to be thinking about, again, your context, your students' abilities, strengths, interests, and their time and stress levels. So I wanted to give you that overview before we now dive into this one piece of the college application process. We'll start with what's the difference between the SAT and the ACT. Now, I grew up in Michigan and not many people took the SAT where I grew up. Uh, if you're in Boston, where many of you probably are, other areas of the East Coast, even parts of the West Coast, you probably heard a lot more about the SAT than the ACT. Now, that has changed quite a bit over the last you know, let's not age ourselves, but 20 plus years since we all took the SAT um, or the ACT, depending on where you lived. Now, colleges don't really care which test you take if they are requiring a test. I say uh, don't really care because there are a few that do care. It's a very small number, but there are some colleges that do prefer one or the other. The vast majority of colleges um, will take either test happily. And there is an official concordance that allows them to translate someone's SAT score to an ACT score um, and vice versa. So they can compare apples to apples. Um, but we have three options here, not just two. And I'll explain why in just a minute. Um, 
traditionally we've had, you can take the SAT or you can take the ACT, but there is a change coming. In March of 2024, if you're based in the US, the SAT is going digital. So it's changing its structure, it's changing the way it asks the question, the length is different, and then the format's gonna be different, it's gonna be done on a computer. Um, so for those sophomores right now, um, even for, um, not really actually, uh, for those sophomores right now, excuse me, um, you've got a choice here. You're gonna be able to choose between three things, not just two. What I was about to say and corrected myself, this year's juniors who are going to be seniors next year um, will have to have their test scores finalized before the digital SAT comes out. So they still only have the two choices of the SAT, the current SAT, and the ACT. So let me start by uh, going through the structure here a little bit, and we'll talk about some of the differences um, and similarities. So you could see just from the diagram, they all kind of test the same thing. There's a reading section, there's a writing language or English section, and then there's math. Um, so you can see the breakdown of, of timing here. Um, between the SAT up at the top here and the ACT down at the bottom, I wanna focus on first, um, one of the major differences is that the ACT has a science section. Now, science as a title of a section may scare some people or students, but really what it is, is, is a technical reading section. It's very similar in structure to the reading section of the ACT. You have a passage. Um, you might have some graphs or charts to read as well because the passages on the science section are about scientific topics or experiments. And then you have comprehension questions that test whether a student can understand what's happening in the experiment, can read a data point off of a graph, can extrapolate a conclusion from some data that's been given to them. But really the, the techniques and strategies are very similar to what you would use in a reading comprehension section. So don't be scared off by science if that feels like it's not a strength for your student. The other difference is that there's still an optional essay on the ACT. The SAT got rid of its essay a couple years back, but the ACT has maintained it. Um, virtually no college requires the ACT essay, but it's worth you checking uh, the testing policies of each school you plan to apply to to see if you need it or not. Like I said, vast majority don't need it, and I don't recommend students do it in those cases. You don't get bonus points for doing extra here. So. In terms of the structure, those are some of the differences. Um, in terms of the kind of tone and pacing of uh, these two tests, they are quite different. Um, now, while they do generally cover the same type of math topics or with a few differences, the way that the ACT and SAT test math is a little bit different. The SAT has this sort of history of being a puzzling test. There's uh, cleverly written questions uh, and you have to kind of treat it like a brain teaser almost to understand how to solve the problem. Usually there's a trick involved, there's a hidden piece of data that if you pay attention to it, it kind of unlocks the problem for you. Um, and that's true kind of across the board on the SAT. It's not as straightforward of a test as the ACT is. The reading section of the SAT draws on slightly more sophisticated passages, and I personally find the reading questions on the SAT to be a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more read between the lines than the ACT, which is quite an empirical test, right? You can go and find the evidence and, and choose your answer um, much more easily, I think, on the S ACT than the SAT. But every student is going to have their own preference. So um, we'll talk about how to choose this. But uh, these are the kind of factors that might make one student prefer one test to the other. Um, some students really love that brain teaser kind of puzzle aspect to the SAT. The other thing that's different is that you get more time per question on the SAT. So even if it does take you a little bit more time to understand how to do the problem, they give you that time. Right? So students who struggle with time pressure might prefer the SAT to the ACT. Now, on the flip side of that, the ACT is, like I said, far more straightforward, far more empirical, but you have to do it all a lot faster. Um, the the uh, 
time per question is less, the overall length of the test is less if you ignore the essay. Um, it's a shorter test than, than, than the SAT, not by much, but you do have to move pretty quickly. So it, it's worth you figuring out which one your student can do better on. It's not a, a case where you wanna do both. So um, let's put a pin in how do you decide and talk about the digital SAT. So the PSAT, which is a, essentially a practice SAT, usually given to juniors in October, um, is going to be digital this October of 2023. And that will be most students' first experience with a digital test at all in this particular format of, of the SAT. Um, they did roll out the digital SAT internationally in March of 2023 haven't been too many bumps in the road. So most people are thinking this is going to be a pretty smooth shift, but that remains to be seen. So the digital SAT is coming out in March of 2024. Um, the same structure, so the same sections, but you'll notice it's much shorter. It's a two hour and 15 minute test about, um, whereas the current SAT is three hours. So this is much shorter. Um, and most people who've looked at example tests, and they are out there, you can get them on the College Board website, because they want people to be able, excuse me, be able to practice. Um, most people say that the questions are a little bit easier. So um, that's something to consider as you are choosing this. Um, the SATs are going to be scored out of 1600. And the ACT is scored out of 36. So we're talking about different scales here for comparing scores as well. All right, so that's what the tests are, but what's test optional? Now that's an admissions policy where students can decide whether or not to submit test scores. So colleges that are test optional do not require students to submit a test score. And there are some variations on this too. There are test blind colleges that will not look at your test score. You can't submit them. Um, there are test flexible colleges where instead of an SAT and ACT, they might accept some other set of tests. Um, but let's focus here on, on test optional. Test optional has been around for a very long time, since 60s. Um, but it has really picked up steam in the last two decades where research has come out uh, that shows colleges can't predict success better with test scores uh, in a significant way. So when colleges are evaluating students for admission, they wanna know, hey, if we admit this student, are they gonna be successful here? And different colleges define success in different ways. At some colleges, it's a C average by the end of your sophomore year. Some colleges might be a slightly higher grade, um, but they're measuring that. When students come in and they look at their grade point averages again at some point in their college career, and of course, when they graduate, um, to see how correlated are these things. And this research that was done in the early 2000s showed that test scores don't really predict that success much better maybe a little bit better, but not much better than grades do alone. And removing that barrier of the SAT, ACT actually helps more students apply. Um, and uh, in theory, uh, brings a little bit more diversity, uh, enables better access um, for students who, for whatever reason, testing is not their strong point or it's not as accessible or uh, they don't have the the time or finances to invest in test prep which is a big barrier for a lot of people so before covid and these are rough numbers uh, before covid there were already more than a thousand test optional colleges in the united states and currently uh when i uh, made this uh, powerpoint presentation there were over 1800 test optional colleges um, for this year's seniors who are who are starting college this fall. Um, and in the near future, what I think we will see is that many of these colleges that put in temporary test optional policies because of the pandemic, many of them will adopt those permanently. Others um, have already pledged to be test optional for several more years and maybe more will extend that sort of temporary policy. And then some colleges are already returning to uh, requiring tests, right? So like I said, a shifting landscape where we really need to keep our finger on the pulse and make sure the colleges that your student is a fit for and wants to apply to, they have a policy that matches what you guys are doing. 
I'm going to give you some examples here. Um, Harvard is one of those that tends to set the tone for what a lot of other colleges do. When they decided to go test optional, they committed uh, to be test optional until the 2025-26 application cycle. So that covers a lot of students. And it's very clear, you know, your student is a sophomore right now. Okay, great. We know we can be test optional if we want to. Um, other schools didn't set as long of a window. So UMD until 2425, Columbia went 2324. That's this next year. Um, others um, have stopped in 2023. So this year, seniors were the last ones to be covered under this test optional policy. USC, I just checked before I signed on here, still has not announced what they're going to do for next year. Um, same with Duke. Um, their policy went until this year. There is still no information about what they're going to do next year or when they will announce uh, what their policy is going to be. So that puts students in a little bit of a kind of pre precarious situation because, well, if Duke or USC is a wonderful match for you in all the other ways, um, do we do a test? Do we not do a test? It's a little bit uh, tricky to, to see. Oh, Bob, thank you. Columbia, I think just announced this. Uh, they have gone permanently SAT, uh, ACT optional, which is, that's big news. Thank you for sharing that. And Bob is one of these people, <laughs> I am going to put you on the spot, Bob. Bob is one of these people that you should absolutely follow. He runs a, a group called Fair Test, which is a testing watchdog, and they keep a really comprehensive list of all the test optional policies and schools. Um, and he's usually the person I hear from first uh, that some college has gone test optional. All right, let's let's keep going here. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, his website's in the uh, in the chat. Um, all right, so now you kind of understand the landscape and what test optional is. But let's look at these pathways, right? If you are going to test, you'll have to decide another pathway within there. You'll have to decide whether you should do the ACT or the SAT. And as we saw, there are some differences that can make an impact on how a student performs on those tests. Um, and I'll talk to you about how, how do you decide that. Um, once you've decided which test you want to do, you're gonna have to prepare for that test. Most students prepare for three to four months. And what I suggest is that you kind of diagnose the areas of weakness, the places where we need to improve uh, performance and make a plan based on that diagnosis when you're going to study and then you've got to practice so much of this is about taking the knowledge that they have and applying it under time conditions in a stressful situation <laughs> so practice is really really key now a lot of people will hire a tutor or take a course or even self-study for this and there are lots of actually very good free resources for students to self-study there are also books um, and there are free or low priced classes and then you've got a range of tutoring options that range from you know pretty affordable uh, to extremely expensive. Um, so that's a decision you'll have to make as a as a family. What are your goals? How much uh, time, effort, money are you willing to put into this process? And how important is this test score going to be in your process? Um, and then make the decision that works for you. So once you've done all of that for usually three to four months, you'll take the official test. Most students do take it two, even three times. I usually don't recommend more than three, um, but there is a usually a, a difference between the first test and the second test. The student just feels more comfortable. They know what to expect. Um, the second test usually goes a little bit better. And however many times you're going to take it, whenever you're going to do it, you will need to lock in your scores by the fall of your senior year. If you plan to apply early to colleges, uh, most of those deadlines are November 1st, November 15th, so you'll need your scores before then if they're due with your college applications. If you're planning to apply regular decision, those applications are due January 1st, January 15th, so you'll need scores by then. And um, I think I have a little uh, graphic showing you when these tests are um, offered. 
right here. Okay. So they are never offered on the same dates, but as you can see, they're offered several times a year. The ACT has a test September, October, December, February, April, June, and July. And then the SAT has August, October, November, December, March, May, and June. And generally the SAT is the first Saturday of the month with a few exceptions, and the ACT is the second Saturday of the month. And of course there are religious uh, exceptions, there might be Sunday testing, there's school day testing. So there are a lot of um, uh, other kind of exceptions to this, but this is the general testing schedule, right? So you need to think ahead quite a bit so that you can plan your at least two test dates, your preparation and everything else before your college deadlines. Now, if you are not going to go the testing route and you're going to go the test optional route, this is the path I recommend. Um, what you want to do instead of worrying about testing, prepping, studying, practicing, you need to actually start looking at your college list. Um, so you want to start identifying colleges that are a true fit for students, and that's quite a nuanced question. I think I did a presentation on it last month. You can find a video of it on our YouTube channel. Um, finding the true fit and make sure that they are test optional or test blind or something that does not require an act or an sat so you're going to invest your energy on building that list of schools that are a good fit for your student varying ranges of selectivity but they also meet this test optional um, policy requirement and then I really recommend that you just commit to that decision. You don't want to have regrets. You don't want to have second thoughts. You don't want to decide two months before deadlines to add a school that is not test optional and then scramble to try to do a test. Like that's not fun for anybody. So really think it through, um, build that list and get excited about that list, commit to it. Now, you can always add, you can always take off. Things don't have to be set in stone, but you need to commit to your decision of going test optional because you don't want to put yourself in a bind. And then you also want to double down on your strengths. And by you, I mean your child, right? Double down on their strengths. Help them see what those strengths are. Help them demonstrate those strengths everywhere they can and help them build upon them. So you want to find ways to uh, demonstrate their academic talents the values that they share with the colleges, all of those things that a college will see as, oh, that makes this kid a really great fit for our student body, our campus, our mission. Those are the things you want to make sure your students are demonstrating all the time. And truthfully, this is very important, even for students who are going to test. This is kind of what sets them apart from everyone else who maybe has the same score and the same grades and similar um, leadership. These are the things that show a college, oh, we're a great match for each other. So grades matter. Grades matter a lot. Um, renew a focus on those academics and make sure that they're as strong as they can be uh, for that student. Um, take on extracurriculars. They may be academic extracurriculars, right? If you're worried uh, about demonstrating a strength in math and science, well, maybe you do something related to math and science outside of school um, to show that this is an interest, this is a strength. Um, and um, you demonstrate it that way through the things you do outside of school. Um, and then very importantly, live your values in your community. That's easier said than done. Um, most high schoolers don't understand what a personal value is or they don't know what their own values are. That's something that we focus on a lot at Signet, right? We have our own values. We want students to find theirs. Um, and that's a great way to identify what colleges might be a good fit. They share some values. Um, and then if you're living them out in your community, you're engaged, you're helpful, you're giving back, and a college will be able to read that as, oh, not only is this a really interesting and engaged student, but look, they believe in the same things that we do. They believe in being this kind of person that we really want to attract to our college. Um, 
So find ways to do that. And that's not always community service. A lot of times it is, um, but it can be a lot of other things. It can be um, family engagement. It could be a part-time job. It could be a research project. Um, it, it could be, you know, summer camps uh, that focus on certain things that your student finds really Im Im important, um, whether they're learning and participating in the summer camp, or they are actually, you know, a counselor or a participant in putting on the programming. A lot of different ways to demonstrate those values. So that's the two main pathways. How do you decide between them? Now, a lot of students are telling me, oh, the SAT doesn't matter anymore, so I'm just not going to do it. Um, and they can believe that it doesn't matter. We know that it does matter at some institutions still. Um, but before they make a decision just based on feelings or a desire to avoid uh, the work that goes along with uh, studying and preparing for a test, my encouragement or my recommendation is to get some data. Let's see how this student is going to do on these tests. And if it's just not worth it, it's not worth it. But in some cases, students will surprise you and they're not so far off from a score that will help them, then I would recommend doing it, right? We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, get the data, talk to an expert, somebody who not only understands how testing works, but also how college admissions works, because these two things are not separate, right? The only reason we're doing the SAT or the ACT is to help a student in the college admissions process. I get a lot of kids who are like, oh, I really want a perfect score on the SAT, and they may already be at a very good score. Um, you know, that's maybe you get some bragging rights for a year, but if you're still talking about your SAT score as an adult, I think maybe your priorities are a little off, right? The only reason to do well on that test is to enable some college admission result that you really want. So stay focused on that goal and talk to somebody who can, who can speak to both of those processes. And then take that information from the expert. You don't have to take their recommendation, you know, straight. Um, but take that recommendation and that data and what you know about your student and their life and your priorities and your goals for them and make the right decision for that situation, right? You've got to take into account all of those different variables and contexts. So let's break that down a little bit more. Get the data. By that, I mean, take official practice tests. They are freely available on each test maker's website. So you could go to College Board um, or the ACT website. Uh, a quick Google will get you there. And you can download a practice test, an answer key, a bubble sheet, the timing rules, uh, and have your student take a test um, of each. I don't recommend they do both on the same day, not even back to back. I usually like to see at least four days between the two tests. It doesn't really matter which one they do first, um, but try to create realistic conditions, right? A quiet environment, timed, uh, they're not using a calculator when they're not allowed to use a calculator, but they do have a calculator available for the calculator approved sections um, and use the bubble sheet too. This is a great way for them to get a taste of what it's going to feel like, but also to get the data we need to assess requisite content knowledge. Do they know the math? Do they know the um, basic science concepts or how to do a reading comprehension uh, exercise? Do they know enough to do well on this test? Um, it will help you see their testing skills and their strategic insights, including timing, which as we talked about is a big differentiator between the SAT and the ACT. Um, and then what their general comfort levels were, like I felt better on this test, or it was easier for me to understand what these questions wanted me to do, and I felt confused by the way the other questions were phrased. Um, and then, of course, the scores. We want to compare the scores. We can use the official concordance to see which one is relatively stronger. Um, and a real testing expert will be able to tell you based on how the student did, uh, maybe not just the number, but looking at where they missed questions, if there are patterns, if they you know, ran out of time, if they felt stressed and made a lot of careless errors, uh, a testing expert will be able to tell you, uh, should be able to tell you, if they were to prep, study, and practice, 
what could they get? What is a reasonable expectation for uh, a final score based on that practice test? Now, the practice test, I, I really make sure to uh, stress this to students. It's it's not um, it's not a fortune teller, right? It doesn't tell us everything we need to know about how a student is going to perform, um, but it can give us some good indication of that. Now, just because they have a rough time on a practice test doesn't mean they can't score well, right? It's really about why did they have a rough time? What were those factors? Are those things that they can change or improve upon? Um, or is this a, a situation where you know, any look at a bubble sheet induces a panic attack, and maybe we don't even want to go there <laughs> because um, it's going to be too stressful and, and, and uh, difficult for a student, right? So go through the exercise of doing the two practice tests and co comparing them uh, with an expert. I will say um, if students are considering or will only be able to take the digital SAT based on the timing of when that uh, is released, they'll want to do the digital SAT as well, which again, freely available on the College Board website. Um, for sophomores, you'll have the choice to test a little earlier and keep with the paper version. So if you test, you take your official SAT before March 2024, you'll be taking the paper version that's out right now. So it's worth you trying that to see if that's a fit for you. Um, but then also trying a digital SAT to see if you score even better, because then maybe you wait until after March of 2024 so that you can take advantage of that test, right? So it, for sophomores, we're comparing three things. For uh, freshmen and younger, hopefully you're not thinking about this yet, but if you are, uh, and that's why you're here, there'll only be two things. There'll be a digital SAT and, and a digital SAT and a paper ACT for them to do. Okay, so you've gotten the data. Now you want to talk to an expert. And now what I've included here is a screenshot of one of our diagnostic reports. So when a student takes uh, a practice test, we put it through a spreadsheet that tells me and my team a lot of very useful things, right? Um, we can see how a student did question by question, where their errors are, whether they guessed if they answered after time was called, which helps us understand, is this a content issue? Is this a timing issue? And then um, you're not seeing it here. This is like a seven page report. Um, we get a lot of charts that also help us understand, okay, what are the things we need to be thinking about here in terms of understanding question types or specific types of content that we wanna focus on? What's the low hanging fruit? Where do we wanna focus our attention if we were to work with a student in a, a tutoring capacity? But like I said, from a, a diagnostic test or a practice test, you could understand potential scores, what to study, when to study, and how to study, um, when a student should test, and we'll think about a first test and maybe a backup second test date, and then how those potential scores will impact the college application process, right? If you've got a list of schools that you're already thinking about, we can help you understand, yeah, this this would probably be a good school uh, or a good score for this school, or you might consider going test optional because that school is looking for something much higher than what we think um, the student is capable of in the next three or four months. Um, so this, I think, is a really essential piece of the process. At Signet, we do this for free. We want you to have the information to make the decisions you need, um, and I'll give you a link to, to sign up for this process um, towards the end of the, the talk here. All right, now, you got some data, you talked to an expert, you still have a decision to make. Um, we use this rubric of required, important, and helpful um, to help you make a, decide, uh, make a decision here. So one, if a college or a scholarship program you're sure you're going to apply to requires testing, well, then you're gonna have to do it. No need to make a difficult decision here where there, it doesn't need to be difficult. Um, if it's important, might be a situation like Maybe a student had some rocky grades and a really strong test score might help show their strength, right? Maybe the rocky grades are not because they struggled to understand the concepts, but maybe they were injured in a sports 
uh, related thing, or maybe they had a, um, uh, an illness or something like that, that, that caused these challenges. And you really want to show their, their strengths and they're a really good tester, maybe testing well. Um, I won't say counteract because it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship that test scores can cancel out bad grades. It's not what I'm trying to say, but it can show a strength where a student's transcript might not show that. And then helpful. This is probably the broadest one um, uh, to, to use to make this decision, um, but you wanna make sure your student can score well enough to be helpful in their application, right? And the way we usually look at that is, well, what's the average test score at these institutions that they're looking at? Generally, if they're at or above the average, yeah, that test score should be helpful. Um, if they are below, well below the average test score for the colleges they're looking at, well, this test score probably won't be helpful, and maybe it's not worth uh, submitting, even if you do take the test, because you'll apply to a range of colleges, and maybe it will be helpful at some and not at others, right? So you can make a nuanced decision there as well. All right couple of important notes that I'm going to open up for questions. Um, as you've seen here, there's there's a bit of a process and a number of decisions you have to make. And then the student also has to prepare for the test and maybe take it twice. So you need to start early enough thinking about this to allow for the work you may have to do. And for that reason, I usually suggest we do this sort of diagnostic and planning process right after 10th grade is done. Now, this is not to say they're going to study and prep right after 10th grade. This is to say we'll do the practice test, we'll see what they mean, and we'll think about a plan that could extend from, you know, the summer after 10th grade all the way through senior fall, right? They don't, they have time to take the test. But because sometimes there may be a, a good amount of work involved, you got to start early enough to leave time for that. So I recommend doing this right after 10th grade. Um, selective colleges with test optional policies have seen their average test scores rise. So I think a, a good example of this is um, U Chicago, which is already a, a quite a rigorous school, very selective. Um, they went test optional, I believe, in 2015 or 2016. I'm sure Bob, you can you know the date off the top of your head. Um, and when they did that, their test scores started to go up. And if you think about it logically, it makes sense. The only people who were submitting test scores were people with really, really strong test scores where they knew it was gonna be an impressive factor in their application, it was gonna help them. And so colleges only report the test scores that they actually get <laughs> from their admitted students. Um, and so the average is gonna go up because you know they're not counting zeros where people aren't reporting test scores. And related to that, we do see um, over the last couple of years that admit rates are a bit higher for those with test scores than for those without. But you also want to remember that the, again, the people who are submitting test scores have really strong test scores. And one of the things we know about the SAT and the ACT is um, strong test scores are typically correlated to wealth family socioeconomic status, where they put an emphasis on testing, on uh, a certain type of education, and have the ability to pay for expensive test preparation services. Um, so those students with those very high test scores, the majority of the time, come from very privileged backgrounds where they have great opportunities to get the best educations and can do expensive summer camps and have enrichment opportunities and they're in strong school districts or at a private school. So they tend to be these um, applicants that um, are very, let's say, competitive uh, compared to maybe the average student. So you want to keep that in mind. It's not just that um, you have to have this score in order to be considered. Um, this data kind of tell, it can tell multiple stories and you want to think about the reality here. Great. All right, so before we go to questions, I want to tell you about some resources that you will be getting shortly. So these slides, the recording, and links to all of these resources on the slide are going to be emailed to you if you RSVP'd. You'll get that. Um, I, I say ASAP. It will probably be tomorrow, but it might be Monday. Um, I share this kind of advice freely and frequently on my new podcast, um, on my LinkedIn page. So if you're not following me already, please follow me there. There's a lot of good stuff. And then on the Signet blog and in our newsletters, um, 
Um, and we do a webinar like this once a month on a different topic related to high school and, and college admissions. So get on our mailing list and you'll know when these are happening. Um, I am always available to you for a free consult. As I was saying at the beginning, I talk to every single client who works with us. Um, so email me, we'll set up a time to talk. We'll see if um, my team is a fit for what you need or even if we're not, I um, sort of live and breathe on just helping people. Um, so talk to me, I will help you as much as I can, even if it means I'm connecting you to another company or another resource. Um, as I mentioned, our diagnostic tests and the analysis process are free to everybody, whether or not you have any intention of signing up with us. Um, I will send you a link to a form where you can just sign up for a free diagnostic test um, straight from that form. You'll get that in the follow up. Um, we also have a totally free grade level specific weekly newsletter. So every Saturday, there's an email that goes out to parents of freshmen, parents of sophomores, parents of juniors, parents of seniors, with different topics that are related to what's happening or what um, those parents should be thinking about right now for their students. We kind of call it a year like just in time guide to high school. So um, I highly encourage you to sign up for that. And then a note that sometimes our kids are just not ready to think about this it's a lot. It's very complicated. I mean, I just spent 50 minutes talking you through these nuances and I didn't even go into a lot of detail. So your 15 year old child is probably just going to glaze over when you start talking to them about this and they may not be ready to engage around this process. But if you want to, you know, have a really good understanding of the timeline and what you can do to kind of create the conditions for success in your home, um, we can work directly with you to help advise you on uh, what might be helpful for your child and, and when you really want to think about intervening and, and getting them to think about something, even if they may not be ready yet, or how to get them ready. All right, with that, I'm going to stop my share. And we will just open up for questions. If you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or just come off mute. And we can talk. I'm going to go to gallery mode here. Uh, Sheila? Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Alex Grant. And you and I have, have spoken before. Yes. Um, the uh, question I had for you was, I think you were just touched on it, but I, I wasn't sure I quite caught all of it. So do you think that the SAT or ACT scores, uh, scores are a little higher than they would otherwise be because of this COVID, you know, anomaly mm -hmm. that you were just talking about. Uh, I was just yeah. wondering if maybe you could just expand a little bit sure. on that. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not talking about the actual scores that students receive. I'm talking about the average scores that colleges report when they are test optional. So for example, if you go to the admissions page of pretty much any college, they'll have something called their freshman profile. And they'll tell you about the class of students they admitted last year, what their high school GPA was on average, what their SAT or ACT score was on average. Most of the time they give you the middle 50%. So at the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. So half of the student body kind of fits within that range. They'll give you what that range is. And as colleges go test optional and students only students with very high test scores start to submit their test scores, that data gets skewed, right? It's not reflecting every single student who applied or who, who got in. It's only reflecting those very high scores of the students who chose to submit their scores. So you've got to kind of take that data with a grain of salt to understand that the reported average may feel very, very high. Uh, at, at a lot of schools. I mean, in many places for the SAT, it's in the 1500s and that's the average. So that's, it's pretty, pretty ridiculously high. I hope that helped. Did that clarify your question? It, it did. So, so you think like the colleges are, uh, the reported averages for these colleges seem to have crept up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Do we have others?
while we're waiting for that question, um, Bob, I don't, I wonder if you don't mind popping on here, telling us a little bit about fair test. And um, I'm sure you have some data points that you could correct <laughs> that I mentioned as well. Hello. Oh, Sheila, there's nothing to correct. That's, okay. a, that's an excellent presentation. And thank uh, you. I very much appreciate the work you do. Um, I think the data is that you presented is largely accurate. We're moving up towards 1,900 of the nation's 2,278 four year schools that are test optional for this fall. Um, already about 1,700 of those schools have announced that they will be test optional at least through. 2024, so the policies apply to current juniors, and about 14, 1,500 schools are permanently test optional or test blind score free. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the SAT, ACT play a much lower role, smaller role in the admissions process, but there are places, uh, very few schools have reverted to requiring test scores, and among the notable ones are MIT, my alma mater. Mm -hmm. So just influential we are. Um, Georgetown, mm -hmm. um, the three schools in the University of Georgia system, the most competitive, Georgia Tech, the University of Georgia, and Georgia College and State University, all Florida public um, right. universities never stop requiring test scores, even when you couldn't take the test. They are right. total test believers. So all nine of those universities, including the University of Florida and Florida State require tests. And three universities in Tennessee, the Board of Governors there, went against the recommendations of those schools and required tests. Beyond that, there are some small, primarily fundamentalist Christian colleges mm -hmm. that require test scores where they require the SAT or the ACT or this new thing called the uh, CLT, right. uh, the classical learning test, which is an SAT clone with uh, classical passages instead of modern reading. But, you know, over the last four years, the test optional and test blind movement went from about 40% of all schools to about 80%. Right. And that is the new normal in college admissions. But everything you said about what students need to do to be sure that they are doing the best thing for the schools where they want to apply is correct. Great. Well, it's good for me to hear. Um, it's not an endorsement of any private company. We are a non Right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. But I always appreciate your perspective on this and, and um, how closely okay. you track this data. So uh, if you haven't yet, please do bookmark um, Fair Tests page. They do, they do great work. So do we have any other questions from the audience here? It looks like maybe we don't. Um, now I know I gave you a lot of information and I tend to talk quite quickly. So um, if you miss something, you know, email me or uh, check back for the recording. Uh, I'm happy to take you through it. And then also think about how all of this really applies to your particular student and your particular situation. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's the thing you should be paying the most attention to um, when kind of trying to navigate all of this. Um, but with that, I'll happily give you all five minutes back to your evening. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, and I hope we can talk again soon. <laughs>